So some very interesting rules reveals for the upcoming big changes to Warhammer 40k today. We've got a leaked page from the new missions pack, some core ways that deployment and going first might change, some nerfs to Necrons and more. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we've got a whole bunch more news for the new Warhammer 40k Arcs of Omen update, the one that's bringing some rather big changes and shake-ups to the game, including that huge new super detachment, different allies rules, and will go hand in hand with points and data slate updates as well. This new mission pack is going up for pre-order this weekend, so I guess Games Workshop are setting up their previews of it, plus it seems that some people are getting their hands on the book, and a rather interesting leaked page has emerged. In the video today we're going to be talking about four major things, look at that leaked army construction page, then talk about the reveals from the Warhammer Plus battle report, basically they played an Arcs of Omen mission and revealed three other fairly big rules changes, deployment and going first changes to Warhammer 40k, three nerfs to the Necrons, and also some changes to the core objectives that you're going to be able to select from that book, and one guard one. A fairly juicy amount of information this time, so let's take it bit by bit. First up, here we have the leaked rules page from the Arcs of Omen Grand Tournament games. This one's basically the first page of the army construction rules, and goes over a few interesting things about mustering armies before you set up for a game. Kind of a shame that we don't have a bit more of a complete rule section on this, it would have been particularly nice to see the allies rules, that's one of the major areas that we don't know too much about yet. In this there's a few basic things that we either already knew about or are expecting, again it's a mission pack for the strike force or the incursion games, so that's 2000 points or 1000 points. We're still keeping the rule of three or rule of two in an incursion, basically not spamming any more than three of one data slate unless it's troops or dedicated transports. And they've got that heroic support stratagem that they mentioned before, the one that means even though you're taking one singular Arcs of Omen detachment, you can still take certain characters twice like Orc war bosses if you spend an extra CP. Otherwise though, for things that Games Workshop hadn't been entirely clear on, we are basically confirmed that armies are going to be starting on six command points like Nephilim, so perhaps still fairly bad news for armies that wanted to spend loads of things pre-game, perhaps armies like Knights and Adeptus Mechanicus might be one of the ones that want to spend a whole ton. Admittedly it will mean that the pressure on those is just a little bit less than it was before though, as you won't be paying for extra detachments in this rule set, so no paying more command points if say you needed a second patrol, or if you wanted to take some superior auxiliary knights along, or to put any units in strategic reserve which apparently is going to be completely command point free. It does seem that the main thing that you're going to be spending command points on pre-game is the Warlord Trait and Relic stratagems here. You still need to pay for them to get your first Warlord Trait and Relic, they're still not free. Plus any other stratagems that you have in your codex, things that might allow you to buy even more Warlord Traits or Relics in, or other pre-game upgrades. Overall I'd say the upshot is that command points probably look like they're going to be fairly similar in scope to Nephilim, but maybe just a little bit easier to come by for some armies that wanted multiple detachments or strategic reserves. Perhaps the single biggest clarification here is that the Arcs of Omen detachment really is mandatory. I was suspecting as much by the way that Games Workshop was talking about it, and the effort that they'd invested into it to try and make sure that it worked for every single faction. I think at least a fair few people were thinking that it would just be an alternate option, and you could still pay command points for detachments if you wanted to, but from these mustering armies rules, you have to include one, and no more than one at that. In general, I wouldn't usually say that this is the biggest restriction in the world. It is a very big and very flexible detachment. As we've mentioned before, it does seem like you'd be able to spam your certain slots really quite easily. You wouldn't have to take things like mandatory troops if you didn't want to. On the other hand though, there are a few builds that maybe might feel the pinch a bit from this. Say for example, if you wanted more than 3 fast attack and more than 3 heavy support, that would no longer be an option in that detachment. You'd either have to commit to extra fast attacks or heavy support, and you couldn't get more of both. The same is true of just going spectacularly heavy on one slot, say for example if you wanted more than 6 heavy support, again that doesn't look like it's an option whatsoever. The other interesting bit from this is the allied detachments, as I mentioned I really would quite like to see that Battle Brothers page and who can ally with what, we know that Botan are going to be able to ally with Imperium now, which is kind of interesting. From these rules they say that the allied detachment must either be a patrol detachment or super heavy auxiliary detachment, both of which will cost 0 CP. And judging by their wording from a previous preview, it sounds like there's potential for the agents of the Imperium to get an exemption from this in the actual Battle Brothers rules. As I said, you could take an auxiliary support detachment as well, instead of your normal allies. Costing 0 CP is quite a big deal for certain allies. Say for example, allied knight armagers or war dogs. They're often quite a common pick to ally into an army for some fast and dangerous objective secures. Having the command point cost of those go from 3 CP down to 0 is going to make them a lot more viable, so I suspect that they might be more popular in this whole thing. 
The section does also clarify that you can only take permitted Battle Brothers allies. We'll have to see the full list of those. One of my biggest questions for that is whether or not the Imperium is going to be able to ally with other Imperial forces. Say, for example, Custodius plus, say, Militarum Tempestus Scions. Would that be a formation that's allowed, or would the Battle Brothers rules prevent that, and you only get certain Imperial forces that are known to be allies, like the Agents or the Knight Freeblades? Necrons next, and as they were one of the factions in the battle report, Games Workshop basically showed off three different nerfs that are going to be happening to them in Arcs of Omen. Currently in 40k, Necrons, I'd say an army of sort of middling power, but are just carried to being a lot better than they would normally be by some spectacular objective work. Their whole army obsec plus pre-game move is really big, and their secondary objectives are arguably the very easiest out of any of the factions in 40k. The first nerf that was previewed is that the Eternal Conqueror's dynastic tradition no longer allows you to take a Circumstance of Awakening, kind of similar to the Hail of Doom nerf for the Eldari. One powerful custom sub-faction trait is no longer allowed to be combined with any other, so if you want whole army obsec, then you're not going to be taking anything else. It seemed basically auto-include for just about every Necron competitive list to take the full army obsec plus relentlessly expansion list for the pre-game move, and there were only a few brave lists that decided to defy that, either going Nihilac or Novok or Mephrit or something. If this change is accurate, and they don't make any changes to say Nihilac, the other one that grants whole army obsec, this means that taking Eternal Conquerors is basically a direct inferior choice to the Nihilac one, as Nihilac also helps out a little bit by making you a little bit tougher in your deployment zone, plus getting a few other support options, plus getting both parts of their unique command protocol, which can give them extra cover, and you can now have in effect all game long. That will be a bit of a shake-up to Necron lists. I can see a whole bunch of people sticking with the massive objective secured in Nihilac if that hasn't changed, but I guess it might see a few of the other Tomb Worlds just see a little bit more play, maybe things like Novok and Mephrit breaking through just a touch more. Then, I think that just about everyone was expecting the Necron secondaries to get toned down a little bit, and the two that were in play in the game both seem to have been hit a little bit, but not much. First up, the Ancient Machinery secondary is one way you have to do actions on midfield objectives, getting four victory points each, and he completed at the end of your turn if you've got objectives secured. This one's taken a small nerf in that you can no longer do it with things like core vehicles. The only units that can do the actions are now core infantry, core bikers, or canoptech units. I guess that this will probably also get a bit of an indirect nerf as well from the loss of their pre-game move as well. It's just going to be a tiny bit harder to zoom units onto midfield objectives and try and grab that objective very early if all of your obsec units have to start in their own deployment zone. Still though, it seems very usable. I feel like in general the vehicles weren't the main thing that was doing this in the first place. Otherwise, the other secondary that was hit was the Treasures of Aeon secondary. This one allows your opponent to select three different objective markers in the midfield, and then the Necron player has to try and take those objectives at the end of each of their turns. You get two victory points if you hold one of them, three victory points if you hold two, or four victory points if you manage to hold all three. Previously, if you held three, this would have been five victory points, so I guess if you just searched onto all the objectives that your opponent nominated, you don't score quite as crazily big as you did before. Again, I'd say that this is probably going to have a slight knock-on nerf as well from the loss of the combination of Eternal Conquerors and Relentlessly Expansionists. It might just be a touch harder to get to far-flung objectives that your opponent nominates. Still though, on a games where you've got just three midfield objectives, I feel like this one's going to be a fairly reliable one that you can score high on. You'd be scoring 10 or 15 if you manage to take one or two objectives each turn. Overall, I don't feel like any of these are massively insurmountable changes to the Necrons. Some slight nerfs to the excesses of their scoring, I guess. The biggest thing is breaking the dynastic combination that the vast majority of competitive lists tended to run. We'll be interested to see if the temptation of Nihilac Obsec is still too great, or whether or not other dynasties get a bit more play. Finally, we've got previews to a trio of other secondary objectives, two core ones, and one for the Imperial Guard. Plus, they did confirm that the Bring It Down secondary objective basically wouldn't be changing at all. First up, we've got Assassination. This one is largely the same as it was before. Three victory points per dead character on the enemy team, plus one extra victory point if you manage to slay the Warlord. Often a fairly strong pick against character-heavy armies. I feel like it is a bit of a risky one, though, if your opponent does manage to hide their characters well. The change for this one is a small buff to it. If you manage to kill the enemy characters with troops or armages or war dogs, then your army gains an additional command point at the end of the battle round. I guess that certainly doesn't hurt, and it might give your army a little bit more in-game power if they are using this. 
I would say that the implementation is just a little bit on the funny side though. I'm not sure why it's specifically more valuable to your army for the troops to be killing the characters as opposed to say your elite forces, particularly as quite a lot of snipers in the game are say elites or heavy support as opposed to being troops. I wouldn't say that this massively changes the amount of time that you'd really want to take this. I guess it's just a nice little bonus if your opponent does happen to have the characters and you've got a lot of your killing power in the troops or the armages section of your army. One of the others that they showed off that may or may not have had a small tweak is Raise the Banners. I'd certainly consider this one one of the stronger generic ones in Nephilim. Basically your infantry units raise banners on objectives, then they score your points until the end of the game unless your opponent can take them down. Interestingly for Games Workshop though, it appears they showed two different versions of it during the same video. One of them basically being the same as it is currently, the other one apparently reverting back to the Warzone Nachmund version where you could take down banners by taking an objective at the start of any phase, not just the enemy command phase. For that reason, it's a bit hard to say whether or not anything's changed. They could have decided to revert it back to the Nakmund one, as banners are pretty powerful, or they might just be sticking with Nephilim, we really don't know at the moment. Finally, it looks like the Imperial Guard Inflexible Command secondary seems to be getting an enormous buff. They seem to have updated it to fit in with the new guard codex with relevant keywords like platoon or squadron, and as well as doing that they seem to have made it massively stronger, kind of weird seeing as this one was already perhaps one of the single strongest secondaries that the guard had, if you built your army somewhat around it, it means that it was almost 15 guaranteed victory points. I really don't understand why they've decided to buff it in basically three different ways. I guess the major upshot is probably that a list built for it will now achieve those 15 victory points, but doesn't need to make quite as much effort. For the new version, you get two victory points if all your platoon infantry units are within six inches of an officer. This is now any officer, not just an infantry officer. And box casters, provided you've got one in the unit and one in your squad, still extend out the range of this to 24 inches. You also get one victory point for every squadron unit being within 12 inches of an officer as well. Again, this is no longer locked to vehicle officers, so you don't necessarily need tank commanders. You could just have things like Cadian Castellans behind your Lehman Rosses if you wanted. Then you've also got two victory points. If an enemy unit is destroyed this battle round by a unit that's been affected by an order, something that's quite likely to happen fairly regularly for the guard army as you try and kill them with your guns. And as before, officers in transport still count as having the officer's keyword, so if you had an officer in a chimera, it still counts. The changes are that you now get two victory points rather than one for killing the enemies with the orders. You don't differentiate between the vehicle and the infantry officers anymore, meaning that you're a lot more flexible on that front. And as with the new guard keywords, it's now only the platoon and squadron units that need to comply. If your vehicles or units don't have those, say like the Valkyrie or Ogryn or Bulgrins, then they don't need to worry at all. Overall, I think it's a slightly perplexing change. In general, with the auto-take secondaries, they tend to tone them down, not make them better. Realistically, though, if guard lists were already going to be scoring very high from this, taking you to an almost certain 15 victory points from it is nice enough, but might not necessarily add you a crazy amount of points to the actual overall score. If a lot of lists might have scored, say, 13 or 14 from it previously, then going up to 15 is only a small boost. Still though, seems a little bit weird to have a secondary that is just this easy. A lot of lists will just be able to max it passively, and it's very hard for your opponent to deny it unless they can kill all your officers instantly. So anyway, rather a lot of good stuff for Arcs of Omen there. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. What do you make of the changes to first turn, the fact that Arcs of Omen detachments are mandatory, and the changes to the objectives and the Necrons? Look forward to hearing your thoughts down in the comments. I will of course review the rules in full once we get them. Looking forward to digging into the changes for each army. Feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics if you'd like to see more updates like this. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the news and updates videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you're interested. The channel's Patreon page is what allows me to keep on keeping these updates coming quite so regularly, so if you are enjoying a lot, then any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits every month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is in the video description. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.